Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Good Coach, Bad Coach. Secrets of great coaches know that the other people never figure out. I'm Coach Michael Bird, the Super Coach. And beside me is Bruce Lund, an expert. Follow him at Bruce Lund. Follow me at Michael Burt. We believe a good coach can change your life. We believe one hour can change your life. We believe your radio, your podcast, your TV show can be your coach. Every week on the greatnessnetwork.com. Greatnessnetwork.com. Say it with me. Greatnessnetwork.com. That's where Good Coach, Bad Coach is, as well as all of our other shows. And when and, and I believe Good Coach can change your life, man. Was that subliminal message? It was. There? It was. Neuro Linguistic, NLP. And Bruce and I are actually going out to see big boy uh, Tony, Tony Robbins, Robbins next week. Three days, four days in L.A. He is a big boy, isn't he? And uh, we believe, like I said, a good coach can change your life. And we created this show because I think there's a lot of bad coaches. Today, Bruce, I spoke to the management team at Accurate Mortgage, which is a very successful mortgage team uh, company, been around for a long time, and I was teaching them how to be a good coach. And they were very intrigued by mm -hmm. this because they know that there's a difference between a manager and a coach. So tee up the topic for us today and let's dig in on how we can help people become better coaches. Yeah, let's remind our viewers too, this, this show really comes from the perspective of student athlete slash employee and super coach Michael Burt, former championship basketball coach and employee or employer. Mm -hmm. employee, employee, employer. Employee. Mm -hmm. e versus employer. There we go. Something like that. He's not even focusing on anyways. Yeah, but yeah we'll, I'm, we'll I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the topic for this show is we actually skipped a week. And so if you guys notice, I was actually gone last week. I was in Seattle watching my Detroit Lions play on Monday Night Football. And so I met a couple friends out there. And the topic for the show is if you didn't watch the game, the Lions lost the game the last minute. Uh, it was a controversial call. The player batted the ball out of bounds. The officials all, basically the NFL came back and said, we blew it. Uh, you guys should score a touchdown there. Okay. Um, but the post-game interview, though, Jim Caldwell is a very mild manner, bleak, you know, kind of a boring guy. Yes. Okay. And so as a fan, man, all I wanted him to do was get up there and just ream into the NFL. You've admitted you're wrong. We should have scored a touchdown. You cost us a game. We're now 0-4. We could have been 1-3. That would have been a big win for them. That's right. Instead, he was just very ho-hum, boring. And so it just got me thinking how mad I was as a fan. And as a player, I would have been the same way. You know, you want your coach to stick up for you in that situation. Yep. Yep. And the opposite of that right now is Jim Harbaugh's in Michigan. And so we're all fired up over Jim Harbaugh, right? That guy's intense all the time. You know right. he's got your back at all times. Right. And so it really just made me start thinking, man, you know, as a great, co a great coach is have your back. And you know it as a player. Yep. And you're willing to fight for them. And so that's the topic of today's show. A great coach has your back, and the players love you for it, right? And so as, for you as a former championship basketball coach, did your players know that you had their back at all times? Y yes, not, not all time. And, and let me tell you why. Early on in my coaching career, and this is a big mistake a lot of coaches make, even coaches making millions of dollars, they don't figure out that they can never build an adversarial relationship. Mm -hmm between them, the person of authority, and the player. So a lot of bad coaches pit themselves against their players. And I did this early in my career, me versus them, mm -hmm. me versus you, and I never won any championships during that period of time. And so the opposite of having your back is that you don't know if I got your back or mm -hmm. not. You don't know if you can trust me or not. You don't know if we're on the same page or not. Because I don't give you the indications that I have your back. I actually give you the other indications that I cannot be trusted. I am not trustworthy. And too many bad coaches make this mistake of building adversarial relationships with their players. But should a coach always have your back? Or are there times where, where they might not want to have your back? I think when some of these NFL players... I, I, here's the question. I've had players get, get arrested. I've had players pulled over on the side of the road by a state trooper. Here's how I, I picture me having their back. I'm the first phone call they make, mm -hmm. and that phone call says, I'm sorry, I've let you down, but I know you believe in me, and you got my back, and you're not going to judge me. I know there's going to be consequences and punishment, but but you're going to be there for me to fight through this. That's what I think yep. it means. Now, does the style of coach matter at all? You know, like I said, I compared Jim Caldwell, who's a very just bleak, boring, bland kind of guy. He's going to say everything that's politically correct. You know, we're already focused on next week. Like I said, it really just irked me for some reason when I, when I started hearing his post-game press conference because, you know, we're all fired up over this game um, versus a guy like Harbaugh, who you can tell, man, that guy's intense at all times. Does coaching style matter when it comes to 
having your players back? Well, I don't know. Would, John, would people say that John Wooden had his players back? I mean, he didn't hoop and holler. He didn't yep. scream. He didn't say anything inappropriate. He probably was fiery. What about Phil Jackson? Phil Jackson sits over there, watches the game happen. So not everybody's like Jim Harbaugh. Not everybody is as intense as Jim Harbaugh is. Now, just because that's a preference that you have, you know, let's look at Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll seems intense and positive. Yep. People like him. But, but, but Caldwell is who he is. Here is the bottom line. He's 0-4. He could have been one in three, but, but he's zero and five, and so that's what I would focus on less on his personality and more on his results. Some people get results in different ways. So here's the question I would ask: Do those players that play for the Lions believe he has their back? You know, and I think it's interesting that when we did a show on the likability of a coach, over 23 percent of the players in the NFL said they would love to play for Pete Carroll mm -hmm. because they think he's a players' coach. Mm -hmm. But then his players come out and said, "Look, this guy's is intense." He just sets very clear expectations. The fact that he has fun doesn't mean he's a wimp. He just gets out there and goes out. He loves what he does for a living. As, as a great coach, when, when is it time to show that fiery side to you? And when is it time to – because you talk about this a lot in the corporate world where you instill these thunderbolts, right? And so you can be positive and intense, but there's, there's a sometimes, though, you just got to instill some kind of firebolt or thunderbolt, right? We're going to hold that thought and come back, and we're actually about to instill it with a company we're working with right now where I saw some uh, lethargic behavior and people checking out and people going through the motions. And we're going to talk about a thunderbolt and why it's so important and do you have other people's back. I'm Coach Michael Burt, the Super Coach. Bruce Lund, the next Burt, the power of the great second in command. And we come back, we're, we're talking today. Does your coach have your back? Hey, this is Coach Michael Burt, and I have a prediction. Within the next five years, every manager in the world will have to become a coach. You know, a good coach will do three things for you. They make you have conversations you don't want to have. They make you do some things you don't want to do. They'll help you become something you didn't think you could become. This transition, what I call the coaching revolution, prompted me to create a program called Turn Your Managers into coaches. What we want to do is drive up engagement, drive up production. We want to become a manager other people want to follow. If you've got managers out there that you want to turn into coaches that engage people in systematic behaviors that allows them to do something tomorrow they simply cannot do today, pick up the phone and call us, 225-8380, 615-225-8380, or email us at info at and we're going to teach you how to turn your managers into great coaches. Hey guys, welcome back. Good coach, bad coach. Secrets of great coaches know the others never figure out. Bruce, let me tell you something, man. There's a lot of bad coaches. I can't tell you how many bad coaches there you're, are in the world. You're pretty serious about yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I, I, get, I see a lot of bad coaches. And, hey, and talking about getting fired up, you're getting fired up. Well, I, Rick Ensel used to say to me, he used to call me Jimmy Naismith. You know, he used to say, look, Jimmy Naismith, because I only won one championship, he won 10. And I would, <laughs> I would joke with him, and he said, hey, I didn't know you invented the game of basketball. But, and I didn't invent the game of basketball, but I have been a successful coach. I have won a lot of games in my day, and I've been able to help people move their ball down the field, okay? How I do it is intense and positive, okay? But I think what you're talking today is do you have my back is a question of loyalty mm -hmm. and trustworthiness and the emotional bank account. And this is a term that Covey introduced in the 90s. Is, is in every transaction between two people, there is a bank account. And that bank account is not built on money, but the currency is trust. And every time we interact, we either build it or we subtract from it. We add or we, we withdraw. Mm -hmm. We're assets or we're liabilities. And that's really where a coach needs to focus on, is how do they add unique value to their players and their team so that they always see them as an asset versus a lot. And we're going to talk about Thunderbolts, right? You're, we're talking about how do you instill a Thunderbolt in whether it's a team setting, athletics, or in the corporate world because you're just about to tell a story of how you're trying to instill some Thunderbolts. Yeah, right now. yesterday I was coaching a group of people, good group of people. I like them, they're leaders, but let me tell you what I saw, Bruce. I saw this. I saw just a group of people just. Does that lean back, like driving? Yeah, yeah, well, I just, I just saw, I just saw. Sipping on some gin and juice. I saw disinterested. I saw uh, zombie-like looks. I saw glo glassed-over eyes. 
I saw a disenchantment with what they're doing. I saw a lack of fire and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And so I sent the CEO and owner of the company an email today, and I said, man, that group needs a Thunderbolt. And a Thunderbolt is something that Pat Riley introduced in a book called The Winner Within. Great, probably one of the greatest coaching book of all time. There's a lot of coaches that write a lot of bad, crappy coaching books, okay? And it's because they don't write them. Somebody else comes in and spends an hour with them, and, mm -hmm. and then they pump out a book, and there's nothing in there of any substance. It's, it's just, and, and so Pat Riley wrote a book called The Winner Within. Every coach, every manager in the world should read it because it talks about the cycles of teams. And he goes through the, the innocent climb, the disease of me, the complacency that happens when you win a lot. And, and he talks about this concept of a thunderbolt, which is a sudden, unexpected jolt of energy. And I told this CEO of the company, your group needs a thunderbolt. They need to wake up and get up and get going. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bruce. What's your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was getting hey, fired up oh, there. Oh, hey, what's your question? I was getting fired up there. Uh, you know, we, we compare a lot, like I said, from the corporate world to the athletic world, right? And my question for you then would be, does it matter the size of the company when it comes to being fiery all the time and having each other's back? And what I mean by that is you have in athletics, you have high school, you have college, and you have pros, right? Yes. Uh, compare that. Let's say you had high school where it would be more, it's much, much more personal, right? We have a small firm within your company. That's right. Small group of people. And so how important is it then for high school people who grow up together, they know each other's stories, to have each other's back, and how does that change as you go up the ranks? How does it change as the companies get bigger? And is it less important then? No, it's not less important, but here's what happens. We, when, if you have a company with 800, 900 employees, or even 100 or 200, you just are not in the trenches with them every day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I noticed today when we went and spoke at a company that the owners of the company were sitting there talking to certain employees. It's the first time they'd ever met them. Yeah. I, I mean, who it's are crazy. you? Yeah. How are you doing? Do you have a family? And that's what happens when you, and we can't imagine it because I got a small firm. We all know each other. We're, we're talking to each other on the weekends, during the day, at night. But, but as this company grows, there may be three or 400 employees at mm -hmm. one point. And I, and, and I hope to know all of them, but I, don't, I may not know all mm -hmm. of them. So, but what happens is that leader is so critical to in planting those thunderbolts. I would think that the coach has got to constantly keep their pulse on what's going on. Yeah. The last question I have before, you, before we get out of here then, um, I was thinking about this. A lot of times you'll see this when, when you start to question whether or not a coach has your back, you'll see these players only meetings, right? Mm. What does that mean? What does a players only meeting mean for a coach? Do you, do you th immediately think negative? In, so, in some cases, yes, it is something negative. But coaches have coaches only meetings, and sometimes players, it is a negative. They, and, it, and it depends on the stakes. Sometimes players get together and want to get rid of the coach because they don't like this or they don't like that. And, and, but sometimes players need to have player only meetings because they need to jerk each other's butting gear. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to step up in that locker room yeah. and police the locker room and say, look, this is pitiful. We're not getting results. We're being compensated to. Or, you know, and that's a players only meeting. And sometimes it is negative. It is evil. It's to get in there and try to undermine the coach. So what advice would you give now for a coach to, to, to basically for their players to know that they have their back? I think this is an individual relationship that you build throughout time and, and over time with your players on a consistent basis of adding money to the emotional bank account where it never is close to bankrupt. And, and here's the deal. If you want to really be trustworthy and have each other's back, do what you said you was going to do. Mm -hmm. Follow through on intention. Always come through and, and do the plus one concept of something extra. Gone are the days, coaches, and don't miss this because this is the million dollar nugget from today's show. A I love million dollar nuggets. A player makes up his or her own mind if they're going to give you their body, their mind, their heart, and their spirit. They can be there, dress up, paint up, spray up, pretty up, show up, and but not be there because they're rebelling or quitting or they've completely checked out on you. And that's because they think you've broken their heart or crushed their spirit. And bad coaches don't get that. And they just try to push harder to force something to happen that ain't going to happen. Yeah. That's good, man. Coach Michael Burke, good coach, bad coach. Hey, that's why they paid me the big money right there, Bruce. Good <laughs> coach, bad coach every week. I think his show comes out on Friday, right, Brandon? Friday, 2 p.m., greatnessnetwork.com, greatnessnetwork.com. Keep our, saying it. Greatnessnetwork.com. That's our new network, baby. We ain't building other people's brands. I think anymore. it's called the greatnessnetwork.com. We're building our own brand, and it's a place where you can become great 
Also, we got to get these podcast numbers up, man. Did you see the pitiful podcast numbers we have nah, on the show? Well, you, you sent them. 30, you sent them to me over the weekend. 40, I couldn't 50 sleep. People, I want thousands. Let's pump this I want out. thousands of people downloading this. We want you guys to have our back. Show good coach, bad coach, Coach Michael Burt and Bruce London. Thank you guys. Part.